Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisig. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government industry leaders in securing cyberspace and securing government agencies. With me on the show today are David Ambrose, the Chief Security Officer, Chief Privacy Officer, Bureau of the Fiscal Service, Department of the Treasury, Dr. Ron Ross, Fellow Information Assurance and Risk Management at NIST, Mark Seward, a Senior Director at Splunk Incorporated, Ken Cartson, Vice President Federal at McAfee, and Al Kinney, Director of Cybersecurity Solutions Group, U.S. Public Sector, HP Enterprise Services. Let's get into the topics and talk a little bit about uh, cybersecurity and other security-related matters. Let's start with Dr. Ron Ross over at NIST. Uh, <clears throat> Ron, can you give us some examples of some areas where you see yourselves making progress? I know NIST plays that uh, central role in sort of setting the framework and the roadmap for the agencies. Where are some areas where you see progress being made? Well, thanks, Jim. I, I think we've we've had a really good year in, uh, in at NIST. Uh, we, uh, as you know, over the past ten years, we've worked uh, developing all the standards and guidelines right. under the Federal Information Security Management Act. This right. past year, we reached out to the private sector with the the new cybersecurity framework, which is targeted at the critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that framework was an important step forward because uh, we collaborated with all of the uh, critical infrastructure sectors, brought people around the table, and that framework emerged from all the ideas, from all the different uh, constituents that we were interfacing with over the past year. It's a very good framework. It brings together all the top-level activities that folks need to focus on without being overly prescriptive. And, you know, most of our critical infrastructure in this country, 90 percent, is owned and operated right. by the private sector. Right. So. That, that's been a great step forward to try to bring this to the national front because these cyber problems we experience are not just federal. They go deep into our critical infrastructure. They affect our economic security, sure. our national security. So uh, that's been a very large step forward, and we're just glad we could do it in a collaborative way. Yeah, tr tremendous. I know we've had uh, discussion before, the dependencies the federal government has, and how many dependencies you have. I know back in my Treasury days, we actually looked yeah. at that question of, you know, even if we do what we need to do, we're relying on uh, supply chains, we're relying on Absolutely. outside, and so th you really, I think this is a great idea to broaden this whole, whole discussion. Uh, Mark Seward over Splunk, yeah, tell us a little bit about some areas where you see progress being made. I, I will tell you, I hear Splunk everywhere I go these days. You guys obviously <laughs> have made, uh, made some, some dents into the security world. We're, we're start, we think we're starting to. Uh, and I have to echo some of what Ron said about uh, the cybersecurity framework. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to raise awareness, uh, especially at the small business level, about uh, cybersecurity, uh, as well as the framework itself, uh, getting uh, believe it or not, getting uh, small businesses and large ones too excited about uh, tackling uh, the framework, uh, understanding their risks, understanding that even though they may be a small business, they have uh, they may have key intellectual property or they may have uh, credit card information that's just as valuable to a small sure. business as a large one. Um, the other area that we're seeing a lot of activity in is the continuous uh, diagnostics right. and mitigation activity right. that uh, the Department of Homeland Security and uh, OMB together are, are, are pushing uh, all of the agencies, all the civilian agencies and everybody across the board to try to uh, make sure that they know what they have, understand what their users are doing, and then build in cybersecurity into the applications, custom applications right. that they may have on board. Right. Terrific. See, look at, look at collaboration already. Uh, Ron was talking about reaching out to the private sector. You're talking about how you're working with small businesses in the private sector to, uh, in the the uh, umbrella of that framework. So uh, all sounding good right out of the box here. Uh, Ken Cartson, uh, I guess McAfee, you know, is synonymous over the years with being uh, a major player in the security space. Uh, how? Uh, give us some ideas of some areas where you see progress being made uh, over this past year. Yeah, I, I believe the, the largest pieces of progress are really around, you know, starting to understand the full scope of the, the totality of infrastructure that requires protection. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the integration that exists between different architectures and, and having reference architectures to go by, you know, we're really starting to finally understand that the conglomerate of devices that exist today is such, so much broader than we ever thought before. And when you think about the Internet of Things and how everything has an IP address ranging from a refrigerator to 
you know, a microwave oven to your car to everything you utilize on a day-to-day -day basis, your phones, your tablets, your, you know, then you have all these real-time operating systems and SCADA-type devices that are legacy. And how do you kind of bring all this together? Because they're all communicating. I mean, even your home thermostat with your electrical monitoring device and how much electricity you use. So how do you bring this all together and be able to provide complete security and platforms uh, that enable you to protect all of these different types of devices and bring that data all back together and, and actually make some sense of it and, yeah. and utilize it for a protection scenario. Yeah, the complexities just continue to grow and just when you think you're getting an idea what the complexity is out there, there'll be new technologies, you'll jump in there that throw a, a whole new set of issues into the equation. It's In a way it's exciting, in a way it's a challenge to stay in front of the issues. Um, Al Kinney, how about over at HP Enterprise Services, what are some of the areas uh, where you see progress being made in, in the security space? Good morning, Jim. Uh, from HP's perspective, this has been the year of integration, I think, as our other panelists have mentioned. We see integration across frameworks, integration in legislation. And at HP, we see integration from the, the home office all the way out through our customers. Uh, we've integrated our cyber defense center in our headquarters. And what it does for us is it protects all of the HP networks. Right. It uses HP products and best of breed products where we don't have one. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this case, we've integrated things with processes, procedures, technology. We're able to bring that then back to our researchers, mm -hmm. through our HP security research group, and then back out into our products and to our customers. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we do have the continue, continuous diagnostics and mitigation program that we've integrated within our lab so that we can prove out technologies, make it modular, and make it available to, uh, to our customers. Yeah, sounds great. It sounds like what you're doing there is uh, first you know, using it internal to show what we can do and then taking uh, lessons learned out to the customers. Uh, um, <clears throat> sounds great. Uh, David Ambrose over at the new Fiscal Bureau uh, service, which was a, I kind of think it's a cool story just to begin with, the fact that Bureau of Public Debt and Financial Management Service were able to integrate and become one so smoothly. Uh, it worked out very well. Uh, congratulations to everybody involved in that. Now you've got the security of that. That's a, a relatively large enterprise, but tell us where uh, you see some progress being made uh, in, in that particular entity. Thanks for having me on the show, Jim. Sure. Thank you. So as you know, the administration has identified that the cybersecurity threat is one of the most serious national security, public safety, and economic challenges we face as a nation. We've succeeded in supporting the administration's cross-agency priority goal for cybersecurity. Specifically, we focused on and been able to account for what data and information is entering and exiting our networks, uh, what components are on our networks, the inventory, keeping track of when security status changes, and as important, who's on our systems. So we've implemented DHS's Trusted Internet Connections, and this improves our security posture and incident response capabilities by consolidating our external access points and enhances our monitoring and situational awareness with U.S. CERT and our own internal security operations centers. In order to be a TIC access provider, you have to meet complex architecture requirements right. and physical security requirements, right. and we've met that for Treasury. We've made significant progress in our situational awareness for continuous monitoring, uh, as envisioned by DHS OMB and NIST. Uh, this includes our ab ability to account for our hardware and software assets, uh, our vulnerabilities that exist, and security configuration baseline changes. Um, the vision of DHS's continuous monitoring program includes being able to answer the question, is the right information getting to the right decision makers in, the, in a timely manner? Right. Um, so we've, been, we've made progress there. Um, lastly, we've made progress with our HSPD-12 initiative to support okay. the PIV subcomponent. Sure. And we've integrated both the PIV and for logical and physical access. Um, and then in the shared services department, um, in 2004, OMB directed agencies to obtain public key infrastructure um, services from shared service providers. So we've been providing that on behalf of Treasury since 2006. Um, and having a shared PKI environment um, drops our operational costs um, across the government. And these savings are realized through a shared development environment, um, shared services, uh, directory services and shared cryptographic, it's hard to say, mm -hmm. uh, hardware. Um, so our current customer base is significant and uh, across the federal uh, PIV environment. Yeah, cool. So the, um, you, you brought up the HSPD-12 PIV and all, you know, and it's um, just about any topic we have on the radio show, someone brings up the identity management or identity authentication issue. It's so important to just about everything we do. Um, let's talk a little bit about a specific program, if, you, if someone could cite. You know, we got some progress being made in the general. Uh, Ken Cartson over McAfee, what, can you point to a specific program that you would 
you know, highlight as one that you think is showing real progress in, uh, in uh, addressing the security issues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and I think there's two ways, uh, you know, I personally look at it. One from the federal perspective of what's being implemented and, and also what we're doing at, at McAfee. Uh, when you look at the federal government, you look, and it's been mentioned, continuous diagnostics and mitigation, CDM, uh, this is an, an incredible program that has gotten off the ground that, that puts an amazing amount of presence as far as the ability to secure devices and to monitor them on a real-time basis. And the overall uh, uh, mechanisms that the government is using to do it is, is really based on the architectures that they've already implemented. Right. You know, if you think about, uh, when we always talk about this in security, from the ground up. When you build something, do it from the ground up with security. And we're trying to overlay overlay security on infrastructure that already exists today. Right. And and for the first time, I'm really seeing a lot of success around that, yeah. where you're, you're seeing companies bring together multiple technologies and capabilities right. and being able to integrate that into a, an infrastructure and architecture that already exists. Right. So they've made amazing progress. And you've started to see task orders released uh, on a regular basis from DHS. Right. Uh, from a McAfee perspective, you know, one of the things we've been big, big proponents of is trying to integrate our own architecture. You know, for years we've had this API type of model where we can leverage investments that our customers have already made in order to have a complete platform. Uh, we're moving in, in more of a broader direction on that, where we're able to implement uh, what we call uh, uh, an, uh, kind of our plumbing and our and okay. the way we communicate with all of our, our devices okay. and opening that up to other devices from other companies and partners so that our customers can leverage that investment that they have already had or already made in their environment and using uh, open, open schemas like sticks and taxi right. to enable communication to exist be between our own solutions and solutions that our customers are already using. Yeah, terrific. Well said. A lot of good stuff there. Uh, Dave Ambrose, you have a specific program you would point to you think is pretty cool in terms of making progress to address these issues? Absolutely. Uh, not from a technology standpoint, more so from a process. Okay. Uh, we've implemented a risk-based approach to our information system continuous monitoring program. And NIST defines ISCM as maintaining ongoing awareness of information security vulnerabilities and threats to support our organizational uh, risk management decisions. Um, our approach uh, involves identifying the organizational risk associated with the system changes and identified vulnerabilities and implementing a risk-based ISCM strategy to ensure that our efforts are focused in the right areas and the right controls for the organization. This represents a change in the traditional three-year ATO cycle. Um, basically, we're looking at, uh, again, the organizational risk along with perhaps a systems FIPS 199 rating, right. coupling that and assigning an organizational risk for prioritizing across yeah. the organization. Sure. So that's, that's a good program. Yep. Um, and again, it, it leads to the benefit of focusing our resources in the right areas and so that the decision uh, leaders of the organization can have uh, information in front of them that uh, for risk-based decisions that feeds into our enterprise management. Yeah, I like that approach too. I used to always argue in risk management that you know, we don't just like make an inventory of everything we have and start doing risk management of every one of them. Let's do an inventory of what we have, but then let's look at where we're most likely to have the, the biggest risks and start there, you know, and then work it. Uh, Ron, uh, awful lot of plugs for NIST here get around the table. You must, you're must you doing something right up there because you've got people talking about how they're following your, your guidance. Is there, you mentioned the, the framework expanding to the private sector. Are there other specific programs you'd point to, you think, that are, are really doing well, making progress? Well, there's a brand new one that we just started uh, about three or four months ago. It has to do with the other side of the security problem. We talked about continuous diagnostics and mitigation. Right. Uh, that really, I, I talk about the problem of cyber uh, as an above the waterline discussion and, and a below the waterline. Mm -hmm. So in the CDM program, when we're talking about managing assets, patching our systems as fast as we can, configuring our components, that's all stuff that happens above the waterline. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the real problems that we have in cyber are below the waterline. This gets to the quality and the development of hardware, software, firmware, and systems. So we have a new publication that is just uh, on the street now in, in draft. It's the uh, special publication 800-160. And it's a uh, system security engineering guideline. So what we're trying to do there is get to the build it right part of the problem. The strategy, build it right, then continuously monitor. Those two things taken together are going to really help us button down the infrastructure, build it right to begin with, make sure that we uh, we deploy the most trustworthy systems we possibly can. Right. It's going to make continuous monitoring a whole lot more effective. So this publication talks about 
what are the best practices in developing more trustworthy, more highly assured software? Yeah. And I equate it to building a bridge or flying in an airplane. We have physics involved in bridge building and right. you know engineering involved in airplane development, and we trust those things implicitly. Right. We need to bring that same type of thing into our cybersecurity yeah, business. I agree. I think that's a great point. Um, I did have the opportunity to, to teach cybersecurity at the graduate level on, on weekend for 17 years, so I do. And I used to always say it's, it's almost disappointing that the term firewall exists because if software were built secure from day one and we've had these kind of discipline that we built secure systems right up front, we wouldn't need firewalls to protect systems from bad things. But anyway, um, Al Kinney, what do you think? What, so if you wanted, if I asked you to point to a specific program you think is doing pretty good, pretty cool thing, well, what would it be? If I had a point of one specific program, I'd go straight back to that DHS Continuous Diagnostics okay. and Mitigation Program. Because what they've done is they've really made a commitment to trustworthiness mm -hmm. in, in our systems. And there's money there. Well, that, that's important as well. And, and when you can put commitment there, both in terms of the, the spirit of commitment and, and financing and the that, money. then it, it becomes something that's really actionable. And mm -hmm. what they've done is been able to pull together uh, an understanding of the network, build that foundation from a, a configuration and security perspective. And upon that foundation, there are so many more things that we can do with a network that we can trust. You, you layer on top of that identity management activities, and now you have full command and control ability. Sure. Within uh, the government, you'll be able to make choices about critical paths, send information the way it needs to go instead of the way it just happens to go. And uh, you'll be able to really recover in a way that is thoughtful after you have an incident. And I think that's one of the most critical pieces that's coming out of the CDM program. Yeah, I think, you know, it's hard to not look at that program right away because, I mean, everyone knows about it and it's in terms of uh, bubbling up and becoming a priority, it probably has done so more so than a lot of other uh, cybersecurity related issues we've seen. Uh, Mark Seward, what do you think? Uh, if I asked you to point at a specific program where you think progress has really been made and perhaps your customers have really, you know, reached out and been able to address a lot of issues that they weren't addressing in the past? I think that a lot of our customers have, have sort of awakened to the value of the data that they've got uh, and the, the need for really taking a look and, and at it and applying analytics to it. Mm -hmm. um, not, to, not to enter a huge echo chamber about uh, CDM, continuous diagnostics and mitigation, but one of the side effects from that really has been the, uh, the fact that you really have to understand uh, application management, you have to understand your IT operations activities, and you have to understand your security activities, and all that has to bubble up to risk. And whether anybody likes it or not, what's really happening is there is, uh, and I probably shouldn't even say this because people, you know, if they're aware of it, maybe they'll stop doing it, but there needs to be, the wall needs to be broken down between IT operations and security. Mm -hmm. And those silos have exist existed for a very long time. And if you read between the lines and the requirements for CDM, right. you'll find that there has to be a meld of those two organizations. And that um, the two stories that need to come together um, uh, Jim, for example, my right. computer's acting funny or strange. Right. That's the typical uh, security operations or IT operations uh, story that you'd get from a user. Right. And then the other side of that is the security-centric story where you've got the security person actually monitoring their sensors and, and mo their IPS, their AV, all of those kinds of things that they have deployed. And those two stories are starting to merge. And the, all of the data around that is, uh, is now being looked at as a pool of information where you can actually run statistical analysis and analytics on that to find out what's normal and what's not. Yeah, right. yeah excellent. Great points there. Um, uh, and, and I think what you're saying there about uh, the disciplines coming together, I guess Dave Ambrose agrees with that since uh, that's, uh, he's one of the security officers where they have actually looked to put those disciplines together. And I think that trend likely will continue. I think very good points. Um, we talked about progress. We talked about some specific programs. I also want to talk about lessons learned, what we're learning as we work our way through all this. But before we do that, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with David Ambrose from uh, the Bureau of the Fiscal Service, uh, Dr. Ron Ross from NIST, Mark Seward from Splunk, Ken Cartson from McAfee, and Al Kinney from HP Enterprise Services. We're talking security, cybersecurity in, in particular. 
as well as uh, other aspects uh, around cybersecurity. Well, we talked about some progress. We talked about um, some specific programs. Let's talk about lessons learned. We like to talk about uh, when, we, when we have uh, panelists with great expertise in this area of sharing some of your lessons learned, which may help others that are uh, addressing the same kind of issues. Let's start with Dave Ambrose uh, over at uh, Fiscal Service. Uh, Dave, what are some like lessons you've learned going through this process that you might want to pass on? Thank you, Jim. Cybersecurity is a team effort that is not unique to any one organization. We all have a common cause to minimize threats and risks impacting our organization's ability to meet its mission. We've made significant progress with sharing information across the government so that if one agency is attacked, there's an opportunity for other agencies to learn about it and implement mitigation before it comes a potential target to them. This can be accomplished at relatively low cost, but the benefits are substantial. Um, this is an area we can continue to improve upon. I was pleased to recently read the proposed legislation on Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2014. Uh, data security is, is certainly an information security problem, but it's also a business area and organizational problem. In order for cybersecurity policies, controls, et cetera, to be effective, all areas of the organization must understand them and be in, uh, in complete buy-in. After all, we are protecting the entire organization's data. You can have the best defense in-depth technologies and processes implemented, but all it takes is one employee to click on a bad email, and we know what can happen there. Right. Um, so we need to ensure individuals making critical decisions are well informed of the cybersecurity risks that, that exist and how they apply to their aspects of the organization. Um, this sometimes can take a cultural change. Um, senior level buy-in coupled with a solid security awareness and training program are definitely steps in the right direction. And lastly, this touches on Dr. Ross's example of we need to get better at building security into all phases of the SDLC. Right. Um, you know, traditionally we address the development and uh, maintenance phases, but we need to get better at the defined design and um, the other phases of the uh, SDLC. Um, an old cliche of pay me now or pay me later definitely applies here. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that new SP, and we'll be looking for that, Dr. Ross. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Uh, let's go to Dr. Ross. Uh, what are some of the lessons you're learning? As you've been in this for quite some time, you've been a leader in the community. I think everyone knows you and sees you in that leadership role. What are some of the lessons learned that you'd like to pass on? There's been so many lessons learned in the past 10 years. I think the, the biggest one uh, is, there's two actually that I'd like to bring up. First, it's going from a general application of security controls across the board to more specialized applications. So there are such diverse missions across the federal government. We have so many different types of cyber sure. attacks and threats that we have the ability now to pick and choose the controls that are actually needed to protect right. specific missions and environments of operation. That specialization really didn't exist a, a decade ago. Right. The second big point is, uh, echoing some of the other panelists, is that Cybersecurity has operated in a vacuum for so many years, and it hasn't been very tightly integrated into uh, four major uh, areas within an organization. Enterprise architecture, two separate activities. Enterprise right. architects aren't talking to the cyber guys, cybersecurity guys. The SDLC is the second area, the uh, systems engineering process, and the last one is acquisition. Unless and until cybersecurity expertise is integrated and tightly right. coupled to those mainstream operations, we're going to continue to go down different paths. Right. And, and cyber it absolutely has to be integrated because um, w these things should be part of the normal way of doing business within organizations. That's a cultural issue sure. that those barriers don't come down very easily in, in most organizations. Yeah, but good points. And it dovetails on what David said. You know, if you don't build it in up front, you're going to be in the reactive mode again. You're going to be, you know, trying to catch up. Bad things will happen, and you'll have to start fixing them, and you'll be adding it. And every, we all know that it costs a lot more to add it after the fact. Uh, Mark, what are some of the lessons learned uh, that uh, Splunk's coming across here as you work your way across government, working with your customers? Yeah, I, I tend to find that uh, a lot of uh, chief information security officers and, and chief information officers, both at the federal level, are, are, are sort of realizing that security really is is a component of agency mission. Mm -hmm. um, uh, resili uh, resilience of applications, uh, making sure that they're secure, all of that is much part is part of a much broader picture. Uh, and as they realize that, they're they're beginning to uh, sort of understand uh, again SDLC, the development life cycle, uh, understanding that when they create an application, when they when they uh, work to create an in-house in application, that those things need to be stress tested and pen tested before they're put online that they're actually using uh, semantic uh, logging. They're, they're actually using Splunk for some of that. 
measuring the, uh, the application before it's put out there. All of those sorts of things are starting to happen. And it's, it's really quite uh, exciting to see um, because, uh, again, security has been siloed off from, from everything for so long right. that, that when you begin to see it be a core part of an agency's mission, then they really realize the value of, uh, of, of security as a component. Right. Yeah, I think you're right, too. I think, you know, it's finally we're getting, you know, in the past, I think everyone thought security, well, um, I'm interested in the return on investment and my stockholders' uh, equity, and I'm interested in lowering costs, and I'm interested in generating revenues if you're in the private sector. And then you say, well, how does security work into that? Well, it doesn't work too well, does it? But I think now we're coupling it with, I think people are seeing, based on the attacks we're seeing out there, that security is being equated with quality, and that if you're an organization that is not getting constantly barred bar hit with attacks, and uh, is, you're, it's creating an image of a more quality organization. And I think that's going to be important down the road for companies that are going to sustain and grow and so forth. Al Kinney, uh, what do you think are some of the lessons learned you're seeing as you, you work with the customers in this area? Uh, thanks, Jim. The lessons that HP has learned along the way have everything to do with scale. Uh, if we're going to win this security problem from the bad guys, we're going to have to come together, share information, and be able to understand the full picture better than they do. And so along the way, HP has done things like the, the largest intranet in the world with the Navy network. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we continually uh, develop the, the most zero-day solutions through our HP uh, Tipping Point uh, Research Center. And uh, in addition to that, we have brought together all kinds of products from many different uh, vendors and proved that they have to be integrated in a different way when you approach them at scale. So now we have programs like uh, the DHS CDM program that is addressing the cybersecurity problem at scale, and those lessons learned ha have to be brought forward uh, to, to make sure that that works out well. Because not everything that works well on a table or in a, in a laboratory uh, will work together at scale with other instruments to bring that uh, information to the right level and analyze it in the right way. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, when the, and the scale changes with the amount of data, and uh, we, the last radio show we did was on big data, and we just talked about the explosion of information and data. It really does throw some challenges out there to traditional storage methods and traditional ways to manipulate data and analyze data and so, so forth. Uh, Ken Kortz and McAfee, how about the lessons learned? What are some of the uh, your words of wisdom you would pass along to those listening to the show in terms of some lessons to learn uh, along the way? Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, to, to second some of the points that were made, and I, I totally agree with with the, the rest of the panelists, ex except for I hope it's McAfee logging and not semantic logging. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it is scale, and it is, you know, how do we look at the total environment? And I think what we've learned from the past is, especially with security, you can't, you can't stovepipe everything. You know, you look at other industries, and I think I've used this example in the past with, you know, things like ERP and, and all, these, all these different tools that came together with accounts receivable and accounts payable and HR systems. And how do you have one total system? Uh, and that's one of the big focuses that McAfee has had or Intel Security has had. And how do we bring all this together? How do we take that firewall and that network IPS and that web gateway? And how do we look at the host capabilities and whitelisting and antivirus and application control and all those types of things? And how do we bring it together? And how do we have actual interoperability, not just integration, but true interoperability mm -hmm. and communicate. And I talked about sticks and taxi before being part of that communication mechanism. Right. And that what we have at data exchange layer, that underlying piece that allows everything to communicate together, get trusted information that we can execute on, whether that's from a, our own GTI or our global technology, uh, or it's somebody else's information, and integrate that in and protect the environment, even if it's our own, if it's our customer's information, and they want to keep that proprietary. Right. Right. Good point. Uh, you have a comment, Mark? Yeah, by the way, that's semantic. Yeah, no, I, I heard. It was semantic. Oh, okay. Was it? it still sounds like <laughs> semantic logic. Yeah, it was semantics, yeah. S-E-M-A-N-T-I-C-S, as opposed to the company exactly. name. But anyway, it was good exactly. dialogue. And, uh, and I guess my reaction to that is there's plenty of room. Uh, there's so much activity going on. I'm sure there's room for all the products out there. But the good news about having the competitive environment, it keeps everyone challenged. It gets creativity. It gets innovation. And it challenges all of you to get out there in front of each other each other in front of the issues, and I think that's healthy for the community. I think the next pivot we're going to see, actually, is, is uh, 
leveraging the CDM program for insider threat. And I think that's uh, probably this. Sure. Uh, we're talking to a lot of folks out there, and that's going to be this fall's hot topic. Yeah, well, insider threat's a big deal for, number one, insider threat being insider bad guys. And then the other thing that I think David brought out is you still have some education and awareness with uh, sort of the accidental criminal that, uh, who I would define as, you know, you hear that still over 80 percent of the malware gets into systems by clicking on attachments to email that you shouldn't be clicking on. So, I mean, I view that as sort of like the accidental criminal. They don't know they're doing something wrong, but they create a major problem. Um, Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, priorities. Um, we talked about some of the lessons and challenges. Uh, Ron, what's on your uh, what's on your front burner for this year? What's uh, what are your your priorities for uh, the next uh, say twelve months? Well, the, the top priority for, for us uh, right now is to continue the development of the 800-160 publication. That's, the again, I'm the build it right part of the problem. Uh, to complement the CDM program and the things that are going on, this is almost a, a two-front attack on, on the adversaries that are doing us a lot of damage, where, where the, the first uh, you know wave is coming with the CDM program, managing those assets above the line. Right. But when you start talking about things like the heart bleed vulnerability, right. Or the one that was talked about at, uh, at the Black Hat uh, conference a week or so ago, uh, the USB, the bad USB, where now the firmware is being compromised on these USB devices. These are difficult issues that have to be looked at below the waterline. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, the 800 -160, and it's not just that uh, life cycle. We're basing it on an international standard, IEEE standard 152.88. It's any life cycle process that can bring discipline and structure to building better quality software, hardware, firmware, and applications. Uh, that is an essential component because some of the, the programs like CDM and things that are looking above the waterline, mm -hmm. some of these things are off the radar. You know, two-thirds of the vulnerabilities that the Defense Science Board talked about a year ago, where we have known vulnerabilities, we have unknown vulnerabilities, and then we have the vulnerabilities the adversary creates within right. your infrastructure, two-thirds of those are off our radar. And those can only be addressed by good architecture and good engineering. So I think one of our biggest challenges is getting the C-suite executives not only focused on the above the waterline, which is things we can mm -hmm. see, sure. but how do we get them engaged in below the waterline discussions? That's where you have to invest. And that's where industry coming together with government and, right. and academia, because those are the, that's where we get our engineers and our scientists and our mathematicians right. that understand how to do the below the waterline stuff. Terrific. Sure, I, I love this analogy. This above above the waterline, below the waterline. So I love doing this show. I get someone comes up with something like really cool that sticks, and then I get to use it uh, all over the place. And people think I'm really smart. You know, say, "Wow, I was pretty." How would you think that out? Yeah, well, th th thanks to Dr. Ross. Uh, um, uh, David, what's important for you? What's uh, what's on your list of priorities uh, for the year? So our priorities for the bureau are focusing on two key areas this year: ensuring we've talked about this, ensuring the cybersecurity awareness throughout the organization, and then measuring our current capabilities and identifying improvements to strengthen our security posture. So specifically, we're looking at strengthening our internal IT controls, uh, enhancing our security awareness training program, um, ensure our cybersecurity professionals are receiving the, uh, the right training, necessary training, uh, give some more guidance to our employees um, on the policies for safeguarding our sensitive information, um, looking to integrate our cyber risks with our enterprise risk management program, uh, enhancing our vulnerability management and incident response programs, um, looking at implementing reporting metrics so that we can measure the effectiveness of our program. And lastly, uh, we talked about the insider threat program. So we have uh, three key areas we're looking to focus on, data loss protections, mm -hmm. um, limited access capabilities, and effective onboarding and offboarding processes for insider threat. Yeah, terrific. Well said. Good, good points there. Uh, Ken Carton, what are some of the uh, priorities uh, over at McAfee this year? Sure. So one of the one of the largest priorities we have is is really all about how do we deliver security. Mm -hmm. uh, the environment's continuously changing as we see it, and and we look at. Uh, our customers and where they're moving to, and a lot of them are moving to the cloud environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm amazed that we've gotten this far and we haven't said the word cloud. Uh, uh, yeah, good point. But it, it's, it's becoming an inherent part of what our customers look to do as far as their outsourcing. And how do we provide security in that type of environment? And you know, you look at the Azure's and, and Amazon Web Services, and we've aggressively started uh, positioning our platforms to be integrated with those types of environments, even even VMware and their hybrid uh, uh, cloud environment. So that's most of how we're starting to to, sure. to look at 
how we enable our security capabilities. You know, how do we do that in their in their environments, which right. in, they're outsourcing to the cloud? How do we make it multi-tenancy uh, so that the cloud providers can actually leverage our capabilities and provide them to their customers, uh, and they have better visibility? Because when you go outsource to a cloud environment, you're really dependent on the security that they sure. that they. Uh, leverage service level agreements all exactly the and they may provide great security but yeah. you don't have visibility to it sure. in, the, in the government environment you yeah. absolutely need that visibility yeah. it's going to take trust you know mm -hmm. the trust factor comes in big when you start doing that uh, mark uh, at Splunk what's the priority well since uh, since cloud was brought up um, you know one of our priorities was was to help speed adoption of, of uh, cloud uh, mm -hmm. computing one of the things we recently announced was the availability of a, a hundred percent uptime service. Uh, using Splunk and uh, and having Splunk in the cloud. Um, so with our own cloud, uh, our own ability to be able to take in massive amounts of data and allow customers to actually analyze that and surface uh, unusual patterns, right. things of that nature, um, that was one. That's one of the main initiatives. I like that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Don't have to start dealing yeah. with those dot nine 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 no. and start multiplying that out to see what does that really mean and everything we're, else. We're operating in whole numbers now. <laughs> okay. uh, no more fractions. <laughs> um, and then uh, understanding a couple of big trends, and that's uh, of course the the lack of uh, qualified trained cybersecurity personnel. Um, we really want to try to start embracing uh, some of the cultural aspects we see of those individuals that are coming out of training who are, you know, they, they know Google, they're, they're gamers, uh, and I think that we're going to see whole UI experiences right. more, more gamified, if you will, if okay. that's even a word where you can actually take a look at, um, uh, at, at cybersecurity in an interface that's more familiar to those kinds of kids that are coming out of, uh, out of college, yeah. and, and then make that a lot easier for them to go in and surface unusual behaviors, unusual activities, uh, outside of what may, may be reported by sensors. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent point. Uh, Al Kinney, what do you think? Uh, priorities for HP Enterprise uh, services this year? Our uh, priorities this year remain largely what they always have been. We want to bring the whole of HP to our customers and help them with their mission and policy objectives. Uh, we need to bring from the above the water line and below the water line perspective, we want to bring uh, things like our, our comprehensive applications threat analysis and fortify services and products together to help build that software right the first time. We want to bring in our ability to do analytics uh, by bringing together uh, tipping point and arc site types of information in a way that brings it from the analytical level all the way through the CXO level, if you will, and provide that decision-making capability for our customers. On top of that, our uh, assured identity uh, efforts are going to enable us to start to look at this insider threat more broadly, not only the typical insider threats, but then across the entire enterprise or a, a few enterprises put together, as in the case of DHS continuous diagnostics and mitigation. Yeah. Terrific. Well said. Um, some great points coming out here. Um, I want to talk now about some of the hard things, the challenges, the constraints, the things that uh, you still need to get over, overcome to get, to get where you want to go. But before we do that, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Dave Ambrose from the Fiscal Service at Treasury, Do uh, Dr. Ron Ross from NIST, Mark Seward from Splunk, Ken Cartson from McAfee, and Al Kinney from HP Enterprise Services. We're talking security, cybersecurity in particular, and other aspects of the, that surround that. Um, we've talked about uh, progress and lessons learned in specific programs. Now let's talk about some of the tough things, the things that you got to accomplish day to day to, to get where you want to go. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Ross, what's uh, some of the challenges you have that you still need to overcome to get to where you really want to go with your programs? There, there's no doubt in my mind that the greatest challenge from our perspective is how do we manage and reduce complexity of the IT infrastructure? Mm -hmm. In, in an environment where we have the greatest IT industry in the world, uh, they're innovating at, a, at an unprecedented pace, and we as consumers, we love the technology, and we continue to buy more of it. Uh, we're doing things now that make us more productive, and all of that adds to the complexity. Sure. It's just it's operating systems, it's middleware, it's applications. Mm -hmm. You can look at the smartphones and the tablets. How do we get our arms around that complexity? Because that's where the adversary lives, in the cracks of the complexity. Yeah. They can find things that the weakest, link. the weakest link. 
And so uh, it's going to be a challenge because it, it means that we have to be able to reduce and manage that complexity, uh, sometimes doing with less mm -hmm. and understanding that when we go with a little bit less, we can do it in a more secure manner. Right. Uh, that's going to be a balancing act, and that's something that's very hard for a lot of uh, CEOs and sure. uh, just, you know, all of us as consumers. It's very hard to deal with. It's a big challenge. Yeah, we talked about that. And just when you think you're getting your hands around it, new technologies enter the equation and add more complexity. Uh, Dave Ambrose, what do you think? What's some of the, the tough things, some of the things you battle day to day that you're trying to get done in order to get where you want to go with your programs? So let me, I'll state some of the, uh, maybe the obvious ones, and that's people and dollars, resources, um, competing operational priorities, uh, uh, Dr. Ross, it's, sure. a, it's a correct balance is what's needed to be found there. Um, some additional challenges is security versus transparency and accountability. Transparency and accountability is, is being encouraged more and more. Um, challenge there again is finding the right balance. Um, I suppose trust is the bridge that connects those two, but unfortunately trust is subjective and uh, can't alone solve those problems uh, or challenges. Both are extremely difficult. To balance. Transparency is not about giving everything to everyone from everywhere, and security is not about unplugging everything right. um, to restrict access. So again, you got to find the balance, um, but I think what's most important is understanding the consequences if that information is in the wrong hands. Uh, we talked about cloud, uh, cloud services, uh, probably one I lose a little bit of sleep over, mm -hmm. um, but again, it's about trust, but it's you need to trust but verify in the nth degree. Um, you're basically expanding your perimeter, so understand that any cloud services you sign up for for your organization, you need to um, ensure those uh, same controls are applied, um, either meet or exceed the controls of your own internal perimeter. And then lastly, the mobile devices we talked about, we can no, no longer just say no to devices, right? We live in a mobile environment where we have to allow the connectivity to our, our organization's assets. So. Uh, we just need to be able to answer three key questions with mobile devices. Who's on our network and systems and implementing a strong authentication? Um, where is our highly sensitive data? Are they on these systems? Is it on these systems? And do we safeguard that high sensitive um, information on these devices with strong encryption? Hey, excellent points. All good, good uh, factors to consider. Um, uh, Mark Seward, what's some of the challenges out there, the constraints, the things you got to get by in order to get where you want to go with your customers? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's getting customers, uh, getting uh, agencies, CIOs, CSOs to realize the value of context in, dis in security decision making. Um, so often, uh, security professionals don't have an, enough information to really be able to tell you what's really going on. Uh, they, they may have information from a security sensor, but they don't know necessarily uh, the, the, uh, the individual, what kind of system they've got, uh, the time and date, the place where that system was accessed from. Um, whether that particular person uh, in, in an insider threat situation, for example, um, had a, for a cleared person uh, with, with a particular clearance, whether or not their credit score dropped right. 200 points in the last month, mm -hmm. uh, indicating some kind of a motive. So thinking about, in a much broader sense, security and thinking about it in the context of all of the data out there and all the breadcrumbs we leave as we go about our daily lives is something that uh, I think that uh, CSOs and CIOs are just waking up to. Yeah, good point. Uh, Ken, Carson, what do you think? What's some of the challenges or big constraints you face day to day that you're tr you need to overcome to get where you want to go? Yeah, I think... Uh uh, Ron and Dave hit it nail on the head. Uh, it's complexity and it's lowering costs. You, you have to decrease that complexity and lower the costs. You know, and, and we've looked at that and, and talked. To, I talked a little bit about how we integrate and have interoperability, but it's more than just that. It's how do you consolidate? How do you bring your solutions together so you're not having this plethora of devices right. everywhere? Like Ron said, we love to buy this new technology, but does it always have to mean a new box or a new piece of software? So we're starting to see a big consolidation across the security uh, uh, sphere. So if you look at firewalls and, and network IPSs and how do you bring that together along with web gateways and URL filtering and, and now you're starting to see next generation firewalls and a consolidation of the network infrastructure so you don't need six network right. devices sitting on top of each other consuming power and having to be managed separately by different consoles. We've started to integrate those with, with next gen firewall. We've also started to do that with SIM. We've looked at that big data and the analytics you're trying to get out of it and the situational situation 
situational awareness that, that you require in your infrastructure and trying to bring that together not just with the data side of it but also the command and control and how can we look at our solutions say not just are we are we leveraging that solution for big data but are we also us, utilizing that for command and control and lowering the cost of training all those individuals right. on operating all those systems that we have in the environment. Right. All right. Good point. Well put. Um, let's, um, we, we're down to about 11 minutes or so to go. Let's talk about the future a little bit here and uh, ask each of you to give us a look into your crystal ball there and share with us your vision for the future where, you know, are we getting to the point where we're going to be proactive and out in front of this stuff? Are we going to get to the point to where we don't have to worry so much about cybersecurity because the solutions are in place and we can just focus on the mission itself uh, with these other things uh, 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 becoming just standard uh, operating procedures. Uh, let's, uh, I'd like to hear from all the panelists. Uh, Dave, what's your crystal ball look like? What's the future look like? Where's this, where's this all going for you? So as long as there's a distributed internet and adversaries exist, I think cyber attacks will, will be unavoidable. But the key is we have to be able to answer the question of have we identified our critical information in the systems and the interdependencies uh, within the business processes? Uh, furthermore, have we identified a reconstitution priority order for those systems? Because not everyone can be number one. Have we identified our risk appetite? And lastly, um, have we established a thorough business continuity and disaster recovery plans? And have we successfully tested them beyond paper exercises? Um, the, f the future of cyber attacks will continue to be a cat and mouse game, unfortunately. So we need to get out in front of them, try to understand where they're coming from um, and who they're trying to target, and then mitigate them as best as possible. And the public and private sector collaboration is key. Mm -hmm. um, organizations that, that build holistic and resilient security postures, including their people, processes, and technologies, will be best suited to sustain uh, the impact and recovery from cyber attacks. So I guess three final points for the future is we need to continue to measure our organization's cybersecurity strategy to predict, detect, prevent, and respond to the cyber attacks. Um, avoid becoming complacent uh, and maintain due diligence. It will continue to be the best defense. And lastly, when addressing cybersecurity as an organization, don't wait for a fatal crash at the intersection before implementing that traffic signal. Yeah, good points, good points, good analogies. And uh, what I heard there was a focus on resilience and being able to recover because we're never going to be able to prevent everything. Uh, Al, what's uh, the future look like to you? What's, it, uh, look, what's your crystal ball look like as to where this is all going? Uh, look to the future. Uh, we see at HP security becoming an integrated portion of operations. No longer will it be something that we also need. It'll be something that comes along naturally. Yeah. And as we do that, we build upon strong foundations uh, of where we can insert data or, or collect data to bring it to the business problem and understand our business problems with the context of security added there and be able to make choices through situational awareness or command and control types of arrangements with our systems. Uh, this amount of information, of course, has a challenge associated with it of, of absorbing that information, analyzing that information. As we move to things like uh, a cloud distribution uh, for our architectures, I think we have the opportunity there to actually become more secure than we have been in the past because of the way that clouds can be continually reconfigured, the way that clouds can be expanded and contracted, and the way that you can add different components for the relative security importance of a particular mission. By having the kind of insight that continuous diagnostic communication will bring, you can understand where you need to apply more resources, apply them, and contract them later when you're done in a way that is very fluid, and it, it flows exactly with the pace of operations that we're going to. So that the future will include necessarily technology, but also a workforce that is going to be advanced, one of the most advanced workforces in the world. Uh, at HP, we have 5,000 security professionals, and keeping them up to date will be one of our biggest challenges along the way. Yeah, terrific. I agree with you, too. I think cloud is not necessarily a, could be viewed as a security risk, but as an opportunity to get rid of a lot of old stuff and start, start afresh with uh, looking at, you know, what do we really need? Uh, Ken Carson, what's it look like for you? Where's this all going? Yeah, uh, to me, I, I agree. There's always going to be new threats. There's always going to be adversaries who are trying to, trying to get into our systems, trying to, trying to steal our, our precious data. 
Um, and you know, a lot of what we've done in the environment is all about trust and identity and access management. And we've had some of that compromised over the last year or so with, with secure ID and tokens and things like that. Uh, and we've seen the environment start to change. And I think this is one of the reasons that Intel acquired McAfee uh, and that we have Intel security is how do, we, how do we get above that surface layer of the water and how do we get, in, in this example, below the operating system and actually integrate with the silicon and the, and the chip. And we look at that identity and access management and the authentication that goes on there. And what we're trying to do is have that at the silicon level. And, and we see applications communicating with users and using the new types of capabilities like certificate pinning uh, to, to authenticate who somebody is, or at least authenticate the application, uh, that the communication is valid between whether it's Google or Amazon or the application in the cloud or on the web uh, with that end host. You know, how do we integrate with that at the chip layer to actually know and understand who the access and the identity is and if it should be trusted? Right. So I see it much more going to that layer and that level, getting below the operating system and, and, and the other types of the BIOS and things like that, the firmware. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well said. Good point, Sarah. Mark <clears throat> Seward, what do you see? In the future, where is this going? I think we're going to see uh, a lot more focus on risk, and uh, some of the components of that are, are going to be uh, supply chain risk uh, in particular. We're going to start uh, really having more emphasis on uh, where things come from, certifying that all of the uh, in data, that all the parts and all the pieces of that came from where we think they came from. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot more uh, interest in uh, being able to do mobile security, uh, all those devices that we have that we carry around with us in our pocket all day long, uh, making sure that we're able to, uh, uh, based on location, for example, the geolocation that uh, is often turned on in those devices, understanding where people are and, and based on that, whether or not they should have access to particular parts of our network. Sure. Um, and that control is going to be a lot more granular. And then also, uh, two other areas, uh, critical infrastructure, I think we're going to see a lot more activity in that particular area, uh, as well as uh, the beginnings of more automated actions uh, and remediation actions that are going to be taking place. Um, uh, there was talk about uh, the self-healing network sure. a while back, uh, about 10 years ago, and I think we're going to start to begin to move toward, uh, at least on some actions, sort of the self-securing network, where we're going to actually see um, active defense employed uh, to make sure that um, the network itself can can defend itself right. uh, and think for itself based on anomalous activity. Yeah, excellent. Excellent points there, uh, smart networks. Uh, Ron, Dr. Ross, what's, uh, what's it all look like for you? You've been in this field for quite some time. You're a noted expert in this area. What do you see down the road here? Well, it has been a long time, and I was just thinking I'm, I'm one of the older folks on the panel here, and I, I go back. Uh, vision is so important in our business. We focus on technology, and there's always so many great innovations going on, so many great pockets of good things, but to me, the biggest challenge is, and this is going to take a national dialogue, how do we articulate the vision that we talked about today, not only building it right, the under, the below the water line, and the above the water line? How do we articulate that to consumers out there because you know the industry reacts to consumers. Sure. And unless and until we can establish that vision so we can get someone to, to talk about the building of quality software, what it means to you as an enterprise and, and the ability for you to carry out your missions and your business functions effectively when we depend 100% on dependable information technology. I remember back when I was, uh, I was 10 years old, uh, 1961, President Kennedy, uh, we were in a space race back then with the Soviet Union, and he had a famous speech, and he said, we're going to go to the moon uh, right. by the end of the decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Right. I never forgot that. Uh, it, was a, it was a visionary speech. Sure. And eight years later, in 1969, on July the 20th, we landed our first uh, moon landing. Absolutely. That was vision. It was a national dialogue. It inspired people to bring together the greatest industry in the world, the, the places where all of the innovation takes place, with the academic community and government providing the leadership. Um, that, that, to me, is what it's going to take to really bring this all together. It's a tough fight, and there, we should have no illusion that the kinds of things we're going to see continuously happening, these the next attack, mm -hmm. the next uh, enterprise with compromises right. of record, that's going to continue until we get this dialogue going and we actually get our game plan together on a big scale, not small scale. Excellent, excellent. And I, I agree with you. These issues are hard. 
Um, the same thing as uh, the president was talking about back in the 1960s. Uh, it's a hard problem, and uh, America rises up to those kinds of issues. Uh, if you want an opportunity, find a difficult problem. Uh, let me do a little summarizing here. Great day, a great uh, dialogue. In progress, I heard uh, a lot of progress broadening out uh, to, the, to the private sector with the framework. Um, I heard a lot about the year of integration. We're looking to integrate and, and begin doing a lot more consolidation of this. And the, uh, in progress, the, just the very fact that IT is a priority, right up, to, right up to the White House now is progress being made in the awareness area. Um, specific programs, we heard about CDM. It uh, popped up uh, quite a bit in the conversation uh, as a, a key thing. A lot of the publications that NIST is working on continue to become specific areas that uh, are going to add value. And we heard a lot about analytics and how the analytics are, are now being used to do a lot more deeper dives and some of that under the waterline kinds of things. Lessons learned uh, came across loud and clear. It's a team effort. Uh, we need the collaboration. We need the sharing. Uh, you need, uh, uh, needs to be done across various levels and disciplines. And we heard a lot about the fact and lessons learned, the more we build into the infrastructure up front and the SDLC as the development's happening, the better off, the easier it's going to be down the road when we're trying to address some of these uh, issues. When we talk priorities, I heard about the NIST publications again, awareness <clears throat> throughout the organization, training, uh, getting uh, good personnel, talked about uh, addressing insider threats, cloud security, next generation workforce, which is going to be totally different with different expectations. Challenges, uh, what came out was the complexity, people, money, context. In the future, things will be an unavoidable, but resilience is going to be important, security built in, supply chain security, mobile security, those kinds of issues. With that, I want to thank our panelists for taking time from their busy, busy schedules to be here and to share your thoughts with us. I want to thank our sponsors for uh, without which we wouldn't have a show. Thanks to the good people here at Federal News Radio, and most importantly, thanks to our listening audience out there that tune into the show. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.